If you guys are curious to know my personal opinion about the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020, then keep on watching. Welcome to my channel. I'm Tina. I'm a corporate lawyer in the Philippines. Ah, the Philippines. Problematic, problematic Philippines. So I just wanted to come on here really randomly and share with you guys my thoughts on the anti-terrorism bill of 2020. I want to preface this by saying that these are my own political opinions. In the exercise of freedom of expression, I am entitled to my own political opinions just as you are entitled to yours. You do have the right to maintain your stance, but I am here today to share with you mine. And actually, the overwhelming majority of the legal community has the same opinion as I do. So if you guys are curious to know my personal opinion about the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020, then keep on watching. Okay, I don't know which is worse. COVID-19, which ravages and shuts down respiratory systems. Or the proposed Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020, which ravages and shuts down constitutionally guaranteed freedom of speech and freedom of expression. One originated in Wuhan, China. The other was drafted into creation right at home, in the Philippines, by the House of Representatives, which is a chamber populated with staunch allies of the Duterte administration. One targets immunocompromised persons. The other targets critics, dissenters, political opponents, and social advocates engaged in the exercise of legitimate rights and freedoms by lawfully expressing their dissent and voicing their criticism, which is the cornerstone of any healthy democracy. One is spread when an infected person coughs or sneezes. The other spreads when law enforcement agents, as long as they are authorized by the Anti-Terrorism Council, are given the green light to detain any person merely suspected of committing any of the acts defined and penalized under the proposed law, which in itself is a concept completely repugnant to the requirement of proving probable cause to a judge for the issuance of an arrest warrant. One created an entry in the WHO's Index of Diseases. The other created a new crime, which is inciting to terrorism without even defining terrorism in a clear-cut categorical, precise way, making its construction and its resulting enforcement highly, highly susceptible to abuse. The other starts with a fever or a cough which progresses to pneumonia or worse. The other starts with a pattern of trampling on channels of criticism, Senator Laila de Lima's incarceration, the silencing of Rappler, the doling of a 1,000 peso budget to the Commission on Human Rights or CHR, Vice President Robredo's Attorney Chel Diocnos, and most recently, Teacher Ronel Masses charges for inciting to sedition, ABS-CBN shutdown, the issuance of NBI subpoenas to netizens who were critical of the government during community quarantine. All of this administration's trampling of these channels of criticism will, unless stopped, ultimately progress to authoritarian rule and in the deterioration of whatever is left of this democracy. One should have been prioritized in view of the government's failure to adequately handle the pandemic during community quarantine. Instead, the other was certified as urgent, with the House of Representatives fast-tracking its passage by adopting by an overwhelming majority a version similar or even identical to the version adopted by the Senate. The existence of one is determined by medical professionals. The existence of, or at least probable cause for the other, can now be determined and the resulting warrant of arrest issued by the executive branch through the Anti-Terrorism Council which is comprised of cabinet secretaries and security officials. This supplants or replaces what used to be the exclusive power of the judicial branch via the courts to issue warrants of arrest. One does not distinguish between infected cells and healthy tissue and indiscriminately attacks both. The other seeks to blur the distinction between criticism which is protected by law on one hand and on the other hand, criticism which crosses over into illegal speech and now indiscriminately criminalizes both types. One was unleashed by accident. The other was unleashed to bind and gag Filipinos into silent submission to systematically enforce this culture of silence and virulent, virulent suppression of constitutionally guaranteed freedoms and rights. One stifles the ability to breathe, the other stifles civil liberties. One can be prevented by washing your hands, the other can possibly be stopped in its legislative tracks if private citizens like you and I express our dissent and our dissonance to this vicious affront on democracy. If our voices are loud enough, then maybe, just maybe, maybe the government will hear us. 
So what is this proposed Anti-Terrorist Act of 2020 anyway? House Bill 6875, otherwise known as the Proposed Anti-Terrorist Act of 2020, amends the Human Security Act and seeks to impose tougher penalties, including life imprisonment, on anyone who will participate in, conspire with, or incite others in the planning and facilitation of a terrorist attack. It proposed stronger and, may I say, draconian measures to contain terroristic activities in the country. The UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, in its report dated June 4, even stated that the proposed 2020 Anti-Terrorism Act, slated to replace the already problematic Human Security Act, dilutes human rights safeguards, broadens the definition of terrorism, and expands the period of detention without warrant. The vague definitions in the Anti-Terrorism Act may violate the principle of legality. The UN even said that currently, there is the Human Security Act in place, and that the Human Security Act in itself gives too much discretion to authorities. And it also said that the definition of terrorism is too broad, and that now this proposed act makes it much worse. In general, the bill defines terrorism as the commission of certain acts in order to intimidate the public, to spread a message of fear, to destabilize society, to create an emergency, or to undermine public safety. It also stated that one of the purposes of terrorism is to provoke or influence the government by intimidation. Let's go through my issues with the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020. From now, we'll refer to it as the Act. And I think it's worth stating that the legal community, a vast majority of us, are one. We really feel like this is a dangerous, dangerous measure. Let's go one by one. Okay, my first issue with the Act is that it is highly, highly prone to abuse because the definition of terrorism is vague and broad. These are the prohibited acts. Number one, engaging in acts intended to cause death or serious bodily injury to any person or endangers a person's life. Engaging in acts intended to cause extensive damage or destruction to a government or public facility, public place, or private property. Engaging in acts intended to cause extensive interference with, damage, or destruction to critical infrastructure. Developing, manufacturing, possessing, acquiring, transporting, supplying, or using weapons. Releasing dangerous substances or causing fire floods or explosions. And this is the important part, guys. When the purpose of such act, by its nature and context, is to intimidate the general public or a segment thereof, create an atmosphere or spread a message of fear, to provoke or influence by intimidation the government or any international organization, or seriously destabilize or destroy the fundamental political, economic, or social structures of the country, or create a public emergency or seriously undermine public safety. Thus, you see that intent is an element in this definition of terrorism. Those acts would constitute terrorism only if the intent is to intimidate the public, create an atmosphere to spread a message of fear, etc. etc. There's another very important part of this section. It says that provided that terrorism as defined in this section shall not include advocacy, protest, dissent, stoppage of work, industrial or mass action, and other similar exercises of civil and political rights which are not intended to cause death or serious physical harm to a person, to endanger a person's life, or to create a serious risk to public safety. Now that is so worrisome. Sure, if you're naive, then you would say, Loko, sabi ng law, protest, dissent, or advocacy would not be considered terrorism, right? Nope. Look closer at the provision. I will mark the very important and very dangerous part here. Which are not intended to cause death or serious physical harm to a person, to endanger a person's life, or to create a serious risk to public safety. The problem with this lies in that phrase. The problem is that it's so easy to attribute that purpose. It's so easy to attribute to a citizen that malicious intent. All the government has to do is to say that, hey, your dissent creates a serious threat to public safety. And moreover, we'll get more into this later, it's not even a judge who determines probable cause of terrorism. It's actually the Anti-Terrorism Council, which is created in the act itself. So let's apply this to a real-life situation. Let's say that someone posted something on Facebook, which is critical of the government. When law enforcement agents attempt to arrest that critic, do you think that that critic can say, oh, wait, 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 Look at this proviso of the act. It says that terrorism shall not include advocacy or dissent. In theory, they would be able to say that. But what do you think is going to happen next? The law enforcement agents are going to invoke that phrase that comes after. Those law enforcement agents are going to invoke the portion which says, which are not intended to cause death or serious physical harm to a person, to endanger a person's life, or to create a serious risk to public safety. All the government has to say, and it will say this, is that, hey, 
your Facebook post was intended to cause or intended to endanger public safety. And abracadabra, that would fall within the definition of terrorism. That Facebook post would be considered a terroristic act. So you see here, it's very dangerous because the government could easily, easily attribute intent by tagging a person's criticism or dissent or advocacy as having been intended or calculated to create a serious risk to public safety. It gives the government the leeway, the discretion to decide if criticism was or was not intended to create a serious risk to public safety. If so, then boom! <laughs> that criticism would squarely fall within the definition of terrorism. So you see, the ambiguity of the act's proposed definition of what constitutes terrorism makes it susceptible to different interpretations. This could very easily lead the whole spectrum of human rights violations. My next issue with the act is that it also fails to distinguish acts of terrorism from acts which are already penalized under existing laws. Because arguably, some of the acts which are penalized are already penalized by the Revised Penal Code or the RPC and special laws. This means that persons can be charged twice for the same offense, which violates your constitutional right against double jeopardy. Okay, my next issue with the act is that it does away with the requirement of probable cause for the issuance of a warrant of arrest. Section 29 of the act authorizes the Anti-Terror Council, which is made up of unelected executive officials, to order the arrest and detention of suspected terrorists. It simply means that law enforcement agents no longer need to prove probable cause to a judge and to a prosecutor in order to arrest and detain a suspect. Under the act, the Anti-Terrorism Council has the power to authorize the police or any law enforcement agent to take into custody any person merely suspected of committing any of the prohibited acts defined and penalized under the act. So basta inauthorize ng Anti-Terrorism Council, go la, arrest la. Do you see the problem with that? Because of mere suspicion, you can be detained. You can be arrested. It's not even reasonable suspicion. It's just suspicion. Do you know how easy it is for someone to say, I suspect that that person is doing terroristic acts? Especially since they know that they don't have to prove it before a judge. What would stop them? What would stop them from abusing this? Do you think that law enforcement agents would exercise restraint when exercising that right to decide who is suspected or not? I don't think so. So you see how legally problematic that is. On a related matter, my next issue with the act is that it places in the executive department powers which exclusively used to belong to the judiciary. I touched on this earlier. Section 29 of the act creates the Anti-Terrorism Council or the ATC composed of top cabinet officials and security officials to do functions otherwise reserved for the courts, like ordering the arrest of people it has designated to be terrorists. Under current laws, warrantless arrests are allowed when a crime is committed in your presence or in case of hot pursuit, in case of probable cause of the arresting person to believe that the person to be arrested committed an offense which had just been committed, and in case of an escaped prisoner, right? But here, even if a person is merely suspected of committing any of the prohibited acts, all all the ATC has to do is to authorize his or her arrest and that person could be arrested without a warrant. So you see the Anti-Terrorism Act expands the grounds for warrantless arrests. And it's not just that it expanded the grounds for warrantless arrests. It expands it based on mere suspicion and therein lies the problem. My next issue with the Act is that it is unconstitutional because it suppresses constitutionally guaranteed free speech and free expression. Under this Act, Inciting to terrorism is penalized. Inciting to terrorism is defined as follows. Any person who, without taking any direct part in the commission of terrorism, shall incite others to the execution of any of the acts specified in Section 4 hereof, by means of speeches, proclamations, writings, emblems, banners, or other representations tending to the same end. So you see, by the mere nature of the act which is sought to be penalized, inciting to terrorism, Freedom of speech is involved. Because how do you incite to terrorism? By your speech. We'll go more into this later. Attorney Chel Diokno has actually compared this new inciting to terrorism to the existing crime of inciting to sedition, which has been used to charge teachers who posted critical content about President Duterte on their social media pages. In the act, terrorism also now includes inciting to, planning, training, preparing, and facilitating a terror act. These acts were not included in the 2007 Human Security Act. It was actually Justice Antonio Carpio who said that because inciting to terrorism is penalized, 
then freedom of speech is involved. And this is a basic constitutional right. My next issue with the act is the prolonged detention without judicial warrant and the lack of accountability for authorities in the event of their delay in the delivery of detained persons to the proper judicial authorities. Under the act, a suspect can be detained without a warrant for 14 days, extendable for 10 more days. So you see, any person suspected of violating the act can be detained for as much as 24 days without even being informed of his or her specific charges. During the time, he or she can be kept in detention without even being charged in court. And again, it's based on mere suspicion, not even probable cause. And to make it even worse, it's mere suspicion of executive officials and not even the independent assessment of judges who decide on probable cause. Ang lala talaga. As some of you guys know, normally, under Article 125 of the Revised Penal Code, a detainee must be delivered to the proper judicial authorities within 12 to 36 hours. Section 18 of the Human Security Act allows law enforcement officers to arrest suspects without any judicial warrant and gives them three days, counted from the moment of arrest or custody or apprehension, to deliver that person to the proper judicial authorities. Like I said, here, the Act proposes to extend that three-day period almost five-fold to 14 days. And again, that period is extendable by another 10 days. The Act even exempts law enforcement officers from the provisions of Article 125 of the Revised Penal Code. That is one of the most striking amendments to the Human Security Act. 24 days! My next issue with the Act is that there is more pressing legislation which should be passed upon. But no! They pass this instead. There are people dying. There are people stranded. There are people who don't know where their next meal is going to come from as a result of the job layoffs, the economy woes, brought about by our government's failure to handle the COVID-19 situation adequately. But then they choose to prioritize a measure which suppresses free speech? You be the judge. So what is the status of the act now? The House of Representatives, which as I said earlier, is filled with Duterte allies, passed the act on its third and final reading on June 3. The Senate earlier approved it in February. Now, because the versions adopted by the House and the Senate are very, very similar, then it doesn't have to go through the bicameral committee or the lengthy bicameral conference committee hearings. Instead, the measure will immediately become an enrolled bill which can be sent directly to Malacanang to President Duterte for his signature. When received by President Duterte, he can sign it, he can veto any or all of its provisions, or he cannot act on it, in which case it will lapse into law. So how do private citizens like you and I move on from this? We have to make noise for our voices to be heard. We have to express our dissent and our dissonance. I have a feeling that the act will be challenged before the courts sooner or later. The Supreme Court, in some cases, would require actual injury before a law could be challenged before them. But for this contested anti-terror act, retired senior associate justice Antonio Carpio said that it can be challenged on its face or right away. Justice Carpio said that a facial challenge is allowed because the anti-terror act touches on fundamental constitutional rights, like the right against warrantless arrests. So what do we do, guys? Is there anything that we can do? Yes, educate yourself on the act, read up on it, educate your family members and your friends, spread knowledge and awareness about it, formulate your opinions on it, and make your opinions known. Dissent, express your disagreement. Let's all express our dissent lawfully. The most important thing is that you express it. Express your dissent now. Because if this thing is signed into law, then you and I could go to jail for doing it. If there's any time in your life wherein you have to speak up about a political issue, then make it now. Our freedoms are slowly being siphoned away. And if we continue allowing the people in power to snatch our freedoms away, right from under our noses, then I think that we will partially be to blame as well if we are all united in expressing our opinion then I think that we can make a difference. I'm going to share with you guys one of my favorite quotes. This is from Edmund Burke. I'm sure some of you guys have heard of this, but I love it all the same. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Ouch, right? Okay, so let's say that citizens are muted because of this act. One might argue, well, we have free press, right? No, we don't. Look at what happened to ABS-CBN. The Duterte government has been slammed for its handling of critics and independent voices such as 
journalists and activists. Suffice it to say that it has a very dismal track record when it comes to free speech or free expression and human rights. In fact, previously, the Duterte government tried to tag through the courts more than 200 people as terrorists, including a United Nations Special Rapporteur. The Philippine police has also tried, but thankfully failed, to charge Vice President Lenny Robredo and Attorney Chel Diokno of inciting to sedition. Under the proposed Anti-Terror Act, I very well could be thrown into jail just for saying that. Just for posting this video. Junk the terror bill. Junk it now. So that is it, you guys. I hope that you learned a little bit about the proposed Anti-Terror Act. Sorry if this video is medyo kalat. It's not as organized as my other videos because it was really top of the mind. I really wanted to make this video while the news reports are fresh, while my rage is fresh. So angry. This is a very dangerous bill, you guys. That's the reason why the legal community and so many social political and human rights groups are opposing it. Are we really that naive to think that law enforcement agents won't abuse it just because they say that they won't abuse it? Nope. Remember that you guys are entitled to your own political opinions. But if you guys agree with mine, then you know what to do. And for those of you who don't agree with me, okay lang naman. Pero wag niyo kaming sisihin pag dinakip kayo ng law enforcement agents without a warrant for 24 days based on mere suspicion. And if you guys don't agree with me, well, okay lang naman because I do have my brothers and sisters in the legal community standing with me. So that is really it, you guys. If you have any questions or comments for me, please leave them in the comment box below. Stay safe, find your voice, use it, and make it heard. Thank you so much for watching and see you in my next video. Bye!